welcome back uh, to this, uh, the third in our Container Expert series. Uh, today we welcome uh, Aisha Kaya and Joseph Barnett, who are going to talk about the container security landscape and best practices for container hardening. Uh, in the chat, we'll be sharing a link to our 2022 public container report. We'll share that in the chat in just a few moments. Uh, and that was released uh, just this past October. So we're a few months on, and Aisha's going to discuss uh, the container security trends that she's seeing as um, a product of preparing these reports, because this, I believe, is the second. Um, but first, let's move on to the introductions for the speakers. So we have Aisha Kaya, who's our senior director. Oh, in fact, Aisha, would you like to introduce yourself? That's probably the better thing to do. <laughs> love to. I would love to. I'm head of analytics and insights. Uh, I'm a data scientist, not a developer or a DevOps engineer, and I um, look at the world of containers, the container landscape from this angle. The cool thing is that it's slim. Uh, it's a data scientist's dream coming true. We scan hundreds of thousands of containers. Last year alone, we have scanned more than 2 million uh, unique images, and that pulls the reports that um, that Martin is talking about. So me and you know my team, uh, the engineers, the, the entire team is obviously obsessed with containers, but we also look at it from that uh, data science angle to try to understand the trends, to um, unveil what's going on under the hood. That's what I will be talking about in a bit. Excellent. And we're also joined by Joseph. Joseph, could you just introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm one of the engineers here at Slim AI, and uh, I've been here, I guess, from the beginning. I'm the first engineer, um, and I'll be talking a little bit about uh, some of our product features. I'll be sharing uh, uh, hardening flows, and uh, if we have enough time, maybe even uh, analysis of vulnerabilities and uh, generating SBOMs. Fantastic. Uh, I'm Martin Wimpress. I am Director of Community at Slim AI, at least for a few more days. Um, and uh, thanks to everyone for being with us. Uh, we're excited to have your participation in this session, and we do encourage you to ask questions in the chat. If anything crosses your mind and you want more information, then do follow up in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, and for anyone not familiar with uh, Zoom webinars, you'll see a Q&A panel um, at the bottom of your Zoom window, um, please put your questions in there or chat right in the chat dialogue and uh, we'll figure out between Anne and myself the, the correct time to sort of introduce those questions for uh, Aisha and Joseph. So uh, without further ado, um, let's get on with it. Let's hand over to Aisha uh, who will get us started. Let me share my screen. Well, the moment I hear about demos, I would like to just speed everything up <laughs> and focus on that part because that's the exciting part. But I would like to quickly go over um, some of the trends, what we have seen back in 2021 in the first report, the containers, um, top publicly available containers report that we published. That was uh, end of October, um, around the time uh, for KubeCon North America. Then end of October, 26th of October, we unveiled the second report, uh, which uh, came in, we basically took the baseline in 2021 and uh, did the Delta in 2022. And the cool thing is that at that time, when we did the uh, baseline uh, versus uh, the, the time when we unveiled the second report, we have scanned 900,000 unique images. So that was a ton more data. The cool thing is, since we have unveiled the report, we have scanned another more than a million more. So we have more than 2x our data size. And I'm so excited to share the insights of what has happened, because as you can see, I'm not going to call this geometric or exponential growth, but it is pretty close in terms of how things are changing in this world. And anyone who studies dynamic systems knows that taking a single snapshot is never enough. So studying dynamic systems like this require 
close attention to changing parameters. You need to be looking at interdependent pieces that work together in these feedback loops in a time series lens. And uh, the, the uh, world of containers is one such dynamic technological system. And containers, as we know, are these um, little atomic units that we build and ship our software. And they have changed how we think about software design, software development. Uh, they reshape the software lifespan in a new and what I think in my perspective in um, unimaginable ways. It is safe to say that we are all using containers everywhere all the time um, for everything related to modern software development across almost all verticals. And I wanted to share this first slide and I don't want to spend too much time about adoption, but this is basically history at this point. This, some of you might remember, is the CNCF survey report back from 2020. And it was saying that the adoption curve of containers were off the charts even then. So it said you know, all of the, in all of these areas from development to test to production, containers, uh, containers are being adopted by companies, especially and most notably the use of containers in production. That's that bar chart on this like far right. That has increased significantly from 84%, sorry, uh, from 23% to 84% in just three years, which basically said that organizations are putting their trust into containers, leveraging them in uh, more and more user facing web applications. The only area that has seen a gradual decrease was POC. And, and that was basically saying that containers are no longer just an idea. So any questions? I know that I speed things up because I'm so excited for the demo part. Uh, no, no, no questions uh, at the moment. Uh, I just find that fascinating that we've got to the beyond the proof state with containers. Yeah, I mean, fast forward to today, Gartner said uh, it, by 2023, by next year, 70% of organizations will be running containerized apps. Uh, in their environments, so that that's that's huge. Like they like user facing uh, container applications will be everywhere, and and that's also shown in uh, many other surveys. Developers are there's this like huge influx of new talent into this area, but challenges are also there. There are a lot of opportunities, but there are a lot of challenges as well, and that's what I would like to focus on. So with these two reports, we focused on the container landscape at large. Vulnerability is the security of these containers is a byproduct. Uh, it's not the only thing that we focused, but I would like to um, shed light on complexity and how vulnerabilities are changing over time in, 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 in this area. And you know, being a data scientist, I obviously am always very interested in the methodology of any study. That's why I brought this up. I wanted to show uh, what kind of uh, categories that we have for the containers that we have chosen. Now, as I said, we are scanning hundreds of thousands of containers. For this study, back in 2021 and 2022, we focused on publicly available containers. And the way we selected, we looked into uh, a couple of things like popularity and um, you know, our uh, use, you know, in some, some internal uh, more qualitative metrics. We definitely took uh, ideas from our in-house container experts. Uh, but we, we, we said we will be focusing on these 165, uh, 165 containers. The cool thing about this is that these containers account for more than 30% of all pool volume. So it might sound like a small handful uh, number of containers, but in terms of use, they are massive. And what we did was we, we basically mocked a CI CD workflow, just thinking of a, of a new developer coming into the container landscape. Uh, and, and we said, what would they do? How would they go about their um, adventure, right? So pulling these containers, scanning them using standard open source tools. So a lot of this is 
are things that you can repeat. Maybe you might, it might be hard to go back in time and pull these containers like we do. We scan them every day, um, especially for vulnerabilities. But you can basically use all of these tools. We used X-Ray from Docker, uh, from, from, I should not say Docker Slim anymore. We did a renaming. So it's the Slim Toolkit that we used, X-Ray from Slim Toolkit. Um, and we used SPAM and vulnerability scanners, um, again, open source tools from Encore, Sift and Gripe. And the things that we were interested in uh, understanding were these questions. We wanted to understand if these containers um, will be easy to use, will they be efficient and safe, and will they cause any issues when we ship our applications to production. And I wanted to just show this very quickly because this is something that people might ask. I'll be doing some baselining comparisons, et cetera. But when you scan your container using different standard tools, I pulled Encore, um, Gripe, Cynic, and Trivi, all um, state-of-the-art good tools out there, you will come across very different total number of vulnerabilities. S bumps might look different as well. And you will also see a very different uh, severity distributions of these vulnerabilities. This is well known. And there are sometimes reasonable uh, you know, explanations of these things. But um, when you do a trend, analysis using the exact same tool over and over again. From a data science perspective, it is still valid. So we, we, we scanned these containers of interest using multiple tools, but for the sake of this analysis, I'll be using Gripe so that those comparisons across time series um, are valid. I can speak in detail about the differences of these scanners and some shortcomings as well. Again, I love these tools, but they are not, not as nothing. They're not 100% um, perfect, <laughs> but that's not the topic of this uh, analysis. Happy to answer questions later. Yes, and I think, you know, Joseph can add some context there as well uh, because of the work that we've been doing with, with these tools. Yeah, accuracy is something that we are obsessed with. We, we try to understand the differences, also the shortcomings, and what can be do what can be done around those. And Joseph and the team has been doing some marvelous work on that on that side. So very quickly um, about um, the findings back in 2021. I'm not going to spend too much time. I just want to baseline the 2021 22 report. So there were three highlights. Um, from that report. The first one, not the most surprising expected, but we validated something that, um, that again, in hindsight might maybe obvious, but it's nice to be able to put some numbers there. So what we have done was we have looked into the, the correlation between the sizes of these containers and how long it took to scan them. And as you can see, there was almost a perfect correlation, linear at the smaller sizes, and then it became a little bit more geometric towards the larger. So the more, the larger the container, it's taking sig like significantly longer to scan those. But for every 500 megabits that were added into the system, we were seeing 50 seconds longer scan times. And if it is a single container that you're scanning every now and then, a developer shipping these things, maybe it's you know, not, it's trivial, but we know that scale changes everything. And we know that if you have hundreds of thousands of containers being shipped multiple times a day by a huge crew of developers, then these things start adding up. And uh, what we said, bloated containers are a can be a time sink for your CI CD pipeline, depending on your scale of operations. Well, and not to manage that, not not to mention that some pipelines or some registries, for that matter, uh, support you know automatic scanning, but those images aren't available for for deployment um, for some number of minutes while those scans are occurring. So that just also elongates the release cycle, where uh, you know many companies today are trying to do you know tens, if not hundreds, of releases a day. 
yeah, size is being thought as a vanity metric and, you know, practitioners. So we, we think that at this point, uh, storage is a commodity. We never really need to think about those things. But if you think about the efficiency of operations, and especially in a dynamic world like containers, um, I, I'm pretty sure even some back of the napkin, you don't have to be a data scientist to, to make those calculations, but the cost implications seem to be significant in a um, relatively like you know, medium sized, even small sized organization, it might add up. Well, and, and furthermore, um, you have specialized applications like uh, app to container from AWS, which takes a legacy application and can turn that into a containerized workload. Uh, there's a lot of uh, legacy corporations that are they're taking their applications and trying to do that. And it seems like such a daunting task to just, um, you know, try and start from scratch for an engineering team on a system that's, you know, maybe uh, based in VMs. So to take those and containerize them, they'd love to, to achieve that and, and gain the scaling uh, that that provides. Unfortunately, um, you know, once they've containerized it, the first, you know, first how they containerize it. And if they do use something like app to container, they might have this massive container. And then there's a fear of what's inside, uh, how vulnerable is it? How long is it going to take uh, to deploy it? Is this, is this harder for us to actually manage and maintain uh, moving forward? And so, uh, you know, some of these things that, that we're looking at, uh, I think we might have some pretty interesting answers for that, even for a legacy company. Brilliant. Yeah, I, I would love to speak about these things from a practitioner's perspective with Joseph. But so, Martin, how, like, do I have 10 more minutes? Should I speed things up a little bit? No, you've, you've got time. Awesome. Awesome. So the second thing was about complexity and how complexity might be hindering understanding even for the best, the, mo the wisest among us. So I know that there's a lot going on um, in here and we will be putting a magnifying lens in one of those charts here, but that were a constellation, a group of graphs that I looked at that literally, um, you know, made me look at my screen with a blank state, <laughs> with a blank stare for, for a while, because I wasn't expecting any one of these. Like I was expecting to see large numbers in uh, the number of packages, special permissions, licenses for the outliers, but even the averages were significantly large. Again, this is past year, last year in 2021. So let's put a magnifying lens in one of those, the package, uh, the number of packages for these different container categories that we looked at. And as you can see, we were looking at um, a, a diverse set of categories that these containers belong to. So programming languages, web development, DevOps containers, et cetera. So in what you're look, looking at is a box plot graph where we are seeing the median number of packages as well as the lower and upper quartiles and the, the largest and the lowest uh, outliers. And, you know, I was, literally again um so shocked to see that uh, some containers have over 1000 packages because i was thinking of these packages and that they are they're the tip of the iceberg right so if a container has 1200 packages what could be the dependency tree of that container look like right this is from a 2029, uh, so 2019 um, study from Darmstadt University, where they were looking at a spatial cluster of packages in the NPM ecosystem. And they said the package reach of the top five packages in the NPM ecosystem were between 134,000 to 166,000. So if there are no intersections, if you only had these five packages in your container, you might have 500,000 packages in your dependency tree. If you have 1,200 packages, and if they might not have this many, like, you know, this deep of a dependency tree, but you can start thinking how the uh, dependency trees can make everything very complicated. Um, so seeing those containers having 1,200, 1,300 packages was one thing. But then there were the averages, and even the averages were surprisingly high. So the average um, container in programming packages, for example, programming um, category had 400 packages. So analyzing this, looking into how many um, 
issues, penetration points might these uh, containers have became a, a huge uh, area of focus for us. The third part, so we focused on the sizes, the complexity, the third area, which I would like to talk a little bit more in detail in 2022 report, was the area where we were focusing on the vulnerabilities. And, um, and obviously, vulnerabilities is not just a count, like a tax surface is much bigger than a vulnerability count, but even the number of vulnerabilities in these containers were surprisingly high. And you will see that in 2022, things have not necessarily improved. But the shocking thing for me at that time was not the number of vulnerabilities in these containers, but the the distribution of the severities of these distributions. Martin, you and I, you know, we were literally like shocked looking at this saying, oh my God, like, you know, of all the uh, categories that we looked at, 20% um, of all vulnerabilities were belonging to a high and critical severity category. We were expecting this to be significantly lower coming from a cybersecurity uh, background, right? We were expecting maybe 5% of everything belonging to these categories, but, a significant percent across all categories belong to these high and critical severity categories, which is a huge backdoor into your company. And what, what I found most interesting about this categorization is where most of this sort of attack surface is added is in production containers containing local dev and infrastructure tooling and build tools that don't actually need to be in production containers um, and you're creating these well instrumented containers that if you do have an unfortunate bug in your application that somebody is able to exploit and land inside your container you've given them a lot of capability to actually disrupt either that container and potentially your sort of adjacent infrastructure so i i found this particular area very very interesting last year and this year because the trend isn't good <laughs> and these are the hackers point of view is something that i always keep in mind but because these are publicly available containers whatever we are unveiling here is already known by those um nation sta state actors like these the, like if they discover such a container running in your environment they already know what's inside period. So let's move on. What we have done after we took that baseline was this like close observation of what's happening in this cluster and beyond. So come 2022, when we were um, looking at the analysis, we had a significantly larger database. So we uh, have scanned at that time when we were running the analysis to 2022 analysis. One thing that I need to mention is that um, why we didn't do this at the end of the year, so not beginning of January, I had this keynote um, on the KubeCon North America main stage, and we wanted to showcase what happened in that 12 years that we looked at. And it was, uh, so that KubeCon date for us, the previous report was um, published in the previous North America KubeCon conference, and that was exactly the time that we wanted to compare our results to. As I said, since then, we have increased our unique uh, images scanned by almost two, like more than 2x. We are at more than 2 million images scanned at this point. But at the report, at the time of this report publication, we have analyzed um, a lot of like hundreds of thousands of container profiles and um, even their s bombs have increased significantly about 40 percent the metadata was increasing significantly and we also looked into a, a lot of new um, cves that were that was introduced into the system yes we were remediating but there are a lot of new cves in the system that point about s bombs is interesting because it speaks to what you were just saying about how the the dependency explosion that you can see you know as software develops and new features are added and new package dependencies get added then consequently the 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 s bomb of those container images grows as well i mean it was such a headache uh, for data storage purposes because my team came to me they said we need to divide these S bombs, S bomb files, uh, into maybe you know two, three pieces so that we can store them effectively. <laughs> I'm like seriously. <laughs> 
So then I need to combine and analyze. It's just like it's such a headache. So we started thinking about how we um, store metadata about the container metadata, <laughs> which is this like you know, uh, weird um, loop that we found ourselves in. But anyways, so 2022 report, three key insights that I would like to share right away about this container landscape, the, the land of containers, the world of containers that we found after that baseline in 2021. Three very important stats that I would like to share because like, we have a ton of statistics. Obviously the data is really uh, insightful, it's large, but uh, the main takeaways that I would like to leave the audience with are, are these three. Um, and it, you know, just by looking at those three numbers, you, you, you will realize that there's a story unfolding before our eyes. The first one is that 60% of the uh, top public containers that we looked at had more vulnerabilities at the time of the report than they did a year ago, okay, 60%. The second one is the 70%. So couple this insight with this other one, which came from a global randomized study that we have run asking questions to developers and DevOps experts. 70% of the developers said their customers are demanding that their containers have zero, zero vulnerabilities, that kind of perfection. And 88% of the developers, the engineers said they admitted to the fact that it has become more challenging to ensure that their containers are free from vulnerabilities. Complexity, the numerous components um, of dependencies in these containers being the number one contributing factor. So containers are more vulnerable than ever. Customers are demanding perfection and developers are feeling the heat of the battle. So let's focus on the findings of the report, the delta between last year and this year. The first one, I already mentioned that the 60% of top public containers have more vulnerabilities than they did before. And I will share a couple of slides in a, in a few minutes that will show that the rest of the containers haven't improved that much. In fact, that improvement might be really shallow and, and, and superficial. In reality, they might have gotten even worse. Um, Today, the average public container has almost 300 vulnerabilities in them. And remember that 20% that shocked Martin and us, uh, Martin and me in the previous report, 20% uh, of the vulnerabilities belonging to a high or critical category. This year, that was 30%. So yes, we were remediating incidents, these vulnerabilities, but we were detecting incidents forex faster than our remediation rate. And the things that we are remediating are low and negligible and sometimes medium level, severity level vulnerabilities. The new ones, the new vulnerabilities added into the system are mostly of high and critical nature. That's the state of vulnerabilities. So we said, 60% have more vulnerabilities than they did before. So let's focus on this one slide. This is a, a magnifying lens into the programming languages and not, not all of them. I pulled just Golang, Node, Python, and Rust um, just for display purposes here. But you can see, what you're looking here is the number, the sheer number of vulnerabilities in 2022, and this is bright red versus 2021. And you can see that in Node, there's some improvement. Significant improvement, I'll say, from 1700s to 1100s, so better uh, management of vulnerabilities in that one. If you look into what really was going on under the hood, and I know there's a lot going on, but focus on what I have highlighted here, the distribution of vulnerabilities between 2021 to 2022 is not telling that bright a uh, positive story because what happened was that yes the number of negligible vulnerabilities compared to 2021 are in a much better place but when you look into the high and critical incidents here they have increased significantly so this is this an improved container compared to others Probably not. So when we talk about the 60% that has more, the rest haven't necessarily improved that much. And I can pro provide you a lot of examples of, of this, um, like 
this type of improvement, which is not necessarily a great um, type of improvement. The second finding from the second report is also about component complexity. And we were just talking about the S bumps. So what we have seen was that, remember how we were looking into the package counts and packages were like, there were a lot of packages even the average container. That number of packages have increased. So today the average public container has almost 400 packages. And it is not just the packages that are um, that are that have increased. Almost every other area of focus, licenses um, have increased, special permissions have increased, containers have more uh, layers, they have become larger, and even the S bombs have increased by more than forty percent. And in in these graphs here, you you are seeing how category or over category, the average SPAM has increased in terms of you know, its size, as well as the maximum um, of these. And you can see there are certain containers, where it is almost 30 megabits, just the metadata about the container, which is unbelievable. But let's tie this to people, because data is data, but how does that impact our people, our organizations? I mentioned that 88% of the developers said they find it more challenging to remove the vulnerabilities from their containers. Only one in four developers we surveyed said they understand how container slimming and hardening works. And this is about understanding. This is not about application, total execution of it. Like wrapping my head around how these things work is different from me actually executing on it. So only one in four developers said they understand. The other piece is the this disconnect between the executives and the frontline workers. So the executives that we asked this question, does your company slim and harden containers before they are released? They said 49%, almost 50% said they think their containers are slimmed and hardened. The people who do the actual work, the frontline developers, um, that like they, they 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 agreed significantly at like less percentages. So they um they it was obvious that the frontline workers had a very different idea about how many you know how they are slimming and containing uh, hardening their containers in their companies, which was also very interesting. So and in this one you know from that that survey, I wanted to emphasize. The scale of operations have changed significantly. We talked about the container adoption trends at the very first slide. And when I saw the answers to these questions, you know, how do your, does your company slim and harden containers? The manual processes were the, the dominant answer here, the, the most common way to slim a container. So at that scale, you know, if, again, scale changes everything. If you have a couple of containers, if it's a single developer doing things every now and then, that's that's one thing. But at that scale, manual operations being the most common way, over 50% of these um, results, they said they are doing these things at, uh, with manual processes, which is basically unacceptable. Okay, I'll um, not stand too much because I think this, the, the, the results speak for themselves, but I would like to say um, I am very hopeful about the future of containers. I know that the awareness has changed significantly in the industry. There are a lot of opportunities. It, uh, containers, containerization of applications provide a ton of opportunities for developers to scale. But then also you can see that there are risks that we need to be thinking about. And we'll be doing a lot more research and we uh, try to arrive at these actionable insights. But at the end of the day, what we want is, um, you know, developers having the best experience possible, but we also want production ready containers to be shipped to production. And for me, it's all about automation and intelligent optimization. We need to provide better tools to developers and DevOps engineers so that they can automate this process through intelligent optimization so they don't have to think about 400 packages per container and their huge deep dependency trees, all these vulnerabilities. If these things find themselves in production, Right. There is a huge attack surface, a backdoor into your organizations that hackers know how to leverage, which yeah. um, is not the best thing for your organization. Well, 
thank you, Aisha, for giving us that summary of the uh, ma massive amount of analysis you've done over the last two years. I think that these container reports are now going to be sort of a uh, uh, an annual blessing for our industry because uh, each year we're going to learn something new and we're also going to be able to benchmark previous year's performance based on where we are now. Um, and as you've highlighted, there are problems and there's a disconnect in the perception as to what the problems are and where the complexity is and wh wh where the tooling um, could be improved or is absent um, versus what uh, practitioners are actually doing. So, Joseph, if I can uh, throw to you, you've been working, you know, on the Slim platform. Um, what have you been working on to try and help the lives of developers because so much of this is charts of this is how bad the problem is but we really want to help people solve the problem so can you tell us a bit about that yeah so um i work in the core team and uh mostly on the back end once in a while if if i'm threatened i'll, I'll touch front end code um so really where i spend most of my focus is thinking about you know, the composition of containers. Uh, one of the things that I experienced a lot through my career is, you know, over the last 25 years is as things shifted more left, you know, I, I became the owner of testing and packaging and uh, deployment and operations um, and security. And that's happening uh, as we speak. And um, it's not uncommon for the security team to come over and say, hey, uh, we need to know what's in your container. What 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 packages do you have? What packages are you using? Um, can you remove the things that uh, you don't need uh, just to to reduce the the landscape of uh, of our threat posture? And of course, I look at them and smile and say, "Ah, sure. Um, is 2029 okay?" Uh, because it's nearly an impossible feat, and um, so what we're doing and what, what we've been uh, making is we started with Docker Slim uh, some number of years ago as, as a hackathon project at, at a Docker con, I believe that was 2015 or 2016. And, uh, you know, we had a bright idea. Well, what if we could just make those people go away? Uh, as a developer, I, I just am exasperated with the amount of energy uh, that, that the organization and, and the industry in general uh, believe that is contained within me. You know, I love uh, I love to think I'm made out of stars, but this is um, a little crazy. So, um, what we are what we are doing is we're we're trying to uh, during runtime and through some static analysis, we're trying to detect what your application actually uses. And uh, with that information, armed with that metadata, what we're doing is we're taking we're moving all of the other things uh, that you don't need. And so that you have what, what we call a, a slimmed image or a hardened image. And uh, with that image, now it's uh, not just much smaller, but, it, but we're also trying to work, you know, right now I'm working on uh, trying to understand, you know, what is the composition of that? What are the containers? What, what is the operating system? Um, because once you've hardened an image or once you've slimmed an image and you remove all of the things that you don't use within your application, you've also removed all of the other metadata that makes it identifiable. And so we're making sure that that's also available. And so uh, let me show you uh, a little bit about that. I'll share my desktop. Please let me know when you can see it. Okay, so there's two approaches to this. Um, I'm gonna show you the demo mode because it's, it's easier to talk about. But when you log in, uh, when you create an account, um, some of the first things that you might do is you might search for, for images and uh, I could show you that, but that's less interesting. Um, but when you do search for images, you have the ability to dig into that image and understand uh, what, is, what is in that image, uh, what are the vulnerabilities that, that image has, and you can understand that that's your baseline if you're using that image today. You also have the ability to add connectors. Uh, these connectors would connect to your uh, private repositories. And we support a, a great number of those. Um, and if you wanted to connect those to your repositories, then you can start to, to do certain analysis with your own images, uh, including hardening. Um, so what we'll do is we'll just try the demo. And you can do this without making any connectors. 
and I'm just going to click through this. So uh, we've got a, a, a pre-defined uh, demo that's uh, focusing on um, Nginx or Next demo, sorry. And this is just going to go to the Slim Cloud. So this is going to go to uh, an S3 back storage that we maintain so that you can uh, not have to worry about making any connectors or pushing to your remote repositories if you just want to play and, and try and understand the image. Um, of course, we, we understand there's different application types. And with that, we might preload a certain amount of uh, automated testing uh, for those application types. So uh, we can exercise your application and try and um, determine uh, you know, what's actually used. Now, you have a number of different other options. For example, um, you know, if you wanted to set custom application paths, uh, say you have a container that, that can be used in multiple ways, you might want to modify that entry point. You also might want to uh, uh, modify some of the other settings related to the, the uh, things that, that you would want to check or make sure that you include. And you could add more of these uh, if you needed to. So for example, you knew right away, hey, I need uh, the node modules directory. Um, let's just make sure we don't remove anything there. You, you know, this is kind of an easier, fast configuration or more of a static configuration. And then of course, you know, this is the image content itself. And so you could uh, look through this and you could select any of the files if you wanted to, just as a static uh, uh, inclusion, but we're not gonna click anything there. Um, if you were using your application as some other type of a manifest where it required uh, other services uh, for, for doing validation or just for basic operations, such as a compose file, you could do that uh, as well. And then if you wanted to add any extra environment variables that might trigger certain behavior for you, uh, you could also add or modify these. But let's pretend for a minute we're not doing any of that. And, uh, we're happy with the configuration. And then what's happening is we're actually running your application in our cloud platform, uh, at least in this scenario, and we're hardening that uh, image. Uh, and what's gonna come out is um, a, a much smaller image that has only the things that are used during that, that testing process. Um, and we can watch the logs uh, while, stream while, while this is going on. Uh, to try and identify any problems with our application. But once we're done, what results is you have uh, both the original information from your image, and then you also have uh, the hardened image. And if you look, we started with a 1.3 gig uh, image, and the resulting image is only 318 megabytes for what's actually used within this Nuxt application. We significantly reduced the number of files in the system. And as you can see, the number of vulnerabilities we started with were well over a thousand and we've uh, slimmed it down, <laughs> pun intended, uh, to about 85. Um, of course, we can go and look at these vulnerabilities and understand them uh, in different ways. Uh, that's great, 93% reduction. Um, and we could, uh, let me see what this button does. Oh, that's super interesting. Okay. Um, and then of course we can we can scroll through these and look at these different vulnerabilities and understand uh, you know maybe what's going on with our system and then what we might need to, to modify. Uh, so if I cared only about the high end criticals, for example, um, and looked for only ones that are you know, not whether they have a fix or not, that would mean that I could I could go and update that package in my base image if I wanted to and remove that vulnerability. So these are actionable, uh, actionable results, which is quite nice. Um, now, this is great. I can, I can go and look at that hardened image. Uh, I can go pull it down. I can see, you know, Let's see, somewhere in here, there we go, file system overlay. We can go and look at the different files that are in the file system and check you know, what, what files are remaining, make sure if we had a special file we needed that it's there. Of course, 
but I should be able to pull this image. Uh, and here, uh, you'd need to go to the Slim Cloud to download this. But if you download this image, you could then load it and run it and, and validate that it works. Um, see this, I've never tried this button from here, but let's see if it works. And so here, here I can actually just dig into the image itself and understand a little bit more about it, but uh, without having to be distracted from the original image. Uh, I can look at, at things like what platforms does it support, uh, what are files with special permissions, what certificates might exist, uh, what are the labels on it, and of course you can see we capture certain information about the hardening itself, etc. Um, we looked a little bit about those vulnerabilities and uh, it doesn't look like this is active quite yet, but we know that this is a hardened image um, and we can, we can look at the different results. Um, we can look at the different results uh, based on either bribe or trivia, which are already um, by default included. And one of the other things we're working on is a bring your own license so that you could uh, plug in or integrate uh, your own scanners as well. Uh, but that being said, this only tells you about vulnerabilities you have in your package or vulnerabilities that you have in your container and packages that you have in your container. This is great, um, but the next piece that I'm working on is related to SBOMs. Because as you know, uh, as you've talked about, even, even rescanning these, uh, new, new vulnerabilities are going to be found potentially every day uh, for any package in the world. And so if you're using those packages, you need to be able to keep an eye on those and understand that uh, over time, your exposure may grow, even though you've already hardened and done the work. And so it'll be important to know if you have uh, containers in the wild, when you might need to, to upgrade that container, especially if uh, there's a fix available because those are actionable by developers, unlike uh, packages which don't have a fix available, it's likely that the developer just can do nothing about that. And so that's just a sunken cost of risk uh, that, that we as developers uh, have to deal with. So one of the other newer things that I'm doing is the idea that uh, I might wanna know what packages are in, in an image. Um, and so let's see. We can, we can look and uh, use the Slim tool, and this is eventually going to be built into the product, is we can look in the Slim tool and we can look at those packages. Now, as you'll notice, I already did uh, some analysis here to generate the SBOMs. And uh, so we can see that we have uh, a great number of uh, packages and what, what package managers uh, those are coming from, what is is the version and how many files uh, on that file system are actually used. Uh, when we do the same uh, for the minified image, which is a little harder because there's no packages or no package manager. There's no flash etc uh, OS release uh, file that tells us what operating system it is. Uh, and so with these hardened images, a lot of them are not scannable by vulnerability scanners. But as you can see, once with this particular image that it's one of my test uh, images, um, we've significantly reduced down uh, the number of packages that are, that are installed in the system. And you can see if we were to look at this, for example, the base files package, we're only now using two files out of that base files package. But if we go up, and we locate that base files. Originally, there were 30 files. So that's also quite interesting. Um, earlier, uh, I generated an SBOM. One of the, the challenges of SBOMs are uh, compatibility. Um, the SBOM specifications uh, in general are, are pretty good, but vendor by vendor, they use the SBOM uh, format in different ways for example, Cyclone DX, and they may include or exclude certain information. And so one SBOM from one vendor is not necessarily compatible with an SBOM from another vendor. And that's terribly difficult for me, especially because 
when I look at the S bomb and I do uh, a vulnerability scan, you can see that I have, in this case, I have 144 vulnerabilities to start with um, from my original image if I scanned it with Gripe. And this is using our SBOM output uh, so that we don't have to pull the image to do that analysis, which saves a significant amount of time, uh, especially if we're considering, you know, trying to do this analysis for hundreds or thousands of images a day. If I look at the SBOM from the hardened image, uh, as you can see, we've reduced that down to 32. Now I'm gonna try to run that same file against Trivi. Um, and if you've ever tried to do this uh, with any SBOMs, you'll see that they're, they're in general not compatible. Uh, but here, if we scroll back up, way up, uh, it says we have 142. So Trivi uh, is valuable in different ways. Um, but it says we have 142 versus say gripe, which says we have 144. Um, but the other interesting thing to note here is we took that same S bomb and we ran it with a new tool. And that's uh, really where I'm trying to, to solve for uh, today is not only uh, being able to identify uh, an S bomb, which tells me which packages are on the system, which is a different question, which uh, than what packages are vulnerable. Most vulnerability reports are only gonna include the packages that, that you have vulnerabilities against, not the packages that you have. And so you may not be watching, uh, depending on, on if you have automation in place, you may not be watching for packages that didn't start with vulnerabilities, uh, especially if it was a new package, uh, it may not start with known vulnerabilities. But over a longer period of time, uh, those things also need to be watched. So understanding what's in your image, the SBOM itself, is going to be a very important part of this process uh, yeah. to secure your containers. We talked a little bit about this in the last session that we did. And one of the things we were talking about there is if you have this information up front and there is a zero day in package foo, it's now super useful that you know your unoptimized images your unhardened images do indeed have um lib foo inside them but actually your hardened images do not and that immediately narrows the focus on those container images you need to focus on in your organization that do in fact contain the you know the the vulnerable code uh, and we've got a question here from tiago Tiago asks, um, does this process catch packages not installed by package managers? You have asked a, an amazing question. Uh, let's see, let's see what I can do. Um, I don't know if I can identify the packages that are not part of package managers themselves yet. And when I say package manager, I mean uh, multiple different types, for example, you've got operating system level package managers. That would be the D package and uh, maybe RPM database uh, and others like that, uh, or the Alpine APK database. Those are, those are operating system level package managers. You also have package managers, which are at the application level. Uh, probably one that many people are familiar with is your packages.json file. That's going to be a, a package manager uh, for an application that that you'll want to understand as well but there will be others for example golang uh or uh has a go.mod file and you can you can determine what's going on in a golang binary uh, by trying to extract that information from the binary and and understand what packages were built into that binary and then uh from there do vulnerability analysis on those packages themselves when you think about building containers, one of the biggest gap that I see is uh, my favorite is just looking at the build kit, uh, the Docker build kit uh, Docker file. Um, you have uh, approximately uh, 72 uh, from clauses in that uh, Docker file, which means they're doing a multi-stage build. And in many of those stages, they're simply copying out one or two binaries into the final image and you're losing your package information. So uh, one of the 
the cool things is, is about this analysis that I, that I just showed you, if we go back a little bit, where I'm looking at these packages, I'm saying, hey, I've got uh, my hardened image and then I've got my original image and we already have that metadata. Um, and that, that allows me to, to generate an SBOM and do that reverse engineering, if you will. But uh, furthermore, there's going to be uh, opportunities that, that we're working on internally where we can identify files that belong to packages that have never been marked as a package manager. And those would be the files that might have come in uh, one of two ways. Uh, you can get those in a multi-stage build where you've copied in a file, or you just had that in source control checked in and you copied it in. Um, and we're working on that. Uh, at the same time, we're also looking at uh, being able to detect packages that are installed or binaries that are downloaded during runtime. That's not an uncommon approach. Uh, one of my uh, good friends, he, he loves to make his application automatically install all of the things that he needs for his application to run. So it just always works. Uh, the challenge with that is if that lives in a container, he doesn't have a complex Docker file, but at runtime, that visibility of those packages uh, just disappears. And so uh, it saves him from uh, having to face a security team, but at the same time, uh, it doesn't tell the real story about what's going on in that image. And so uh, both of those are uh, something that I'm working on. That's fabulous stuff. So there's a few things here that um, I absolutely love and would have would have sold body parts for in in a past life when I was uh, uh, an information risk manager. So first of all, one of the things that's really important here is I should identified that there is this uh, request on container producers from the consumers of those containers to reduce the number of vulnerabilities in their containers. And this tooling is able to demonstrate that because although you showed a sort of a one-time snapshot there the before and after this was the original image this was the hardened image and this was the reduction in vulnerabilities in that image with each revision of the container that you publish these vulnerability reports can be produced and within this tool you can trend those over time so you can actually demonstrate that ideally you're, you've got a diminishing number of vulnerabilities or if you claim last week I had 20 vulnerabilities and I've definitely fixed three but the report that you produce for your consumers says you've still got 20 vulnerabilities at least you can demonstrate the three that you said you fixed have indeed gone away and been resolved so this is very powerful tooling um, and that um, SBOM analysis is as i said also critical for actually understanding the landscape the software that you have deployed across your infrastructure uh, and being able to answer questions at the critical time as to whether or you know what your exposure is and how much you're exposed to insert today's critical vulnerability that you need to deal with It's fantastic stuff. I absolutely love it. <laughs> and the uh, those reports have also uh, improved in visual styling since uh, I saw them a couple of weeks ago. So they're looking looking even more beautiful. Right, we're we're running out of time. In fact, we're a little bit over. So if there's any last minute questions, um, please do feel free to post them in here, and we'll try and get to them. If uh, you do think of something after the fact, then you can always uh, head to slim.ai and join our community discord and you can post any questions or follow up in there and we'll be happy to answer uh, any questions that you might have um, i would like to thank everyone for their participation today thank you for your questions and comments uh, and thank you to our presenters aisha and joseph i hope you've learned something and you've got something to take away to your teams to uh, educate them about um, what's actually going on in the industry and maybe whether or not you're a part of that trend and now hopefully armed with information to go away and solve those problems rather than just tell everyone how bad the problem is that you think you might have. Um, so, uh, and as a reminder, <laughs> everything that Joseph's just shown you with the vulnerability scanning and container intelligence, that's all available free to use on the slim.ia platform, slim.ai platform. So again, head to slim.ai, <clears throat> There's a get started button, 
uh, for free. You can go and try it out. You can hook it up to uh, a public image of your own and actually play with these tools today. So whilst it's in beta, it's um, free for you to go and learn. Yes. I just wanted to mention one more thing. Now. Uh, <clears throat> I totally uh, didn't realize I spaced this off. Is I, I showed uh, hardening only in the UI. Uh, and that's great, but that's not necessarily how developers work. Um, so uh, I encourage folks to go and check it out. Uh, we have the ability to instrument the image so that you can run the image in your environment natively uh, and collect the, the telemetry for that information and then harden those images uh, uh, after running real tests or running in a, in a real environment such as staging, um, which is also going to be a very valuable thing for uh, most developers. Um, so I encourage you to go check that out as well. And sorry about that. Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions and uh, you uh, just want to uh, contact us via email, drop your questions to info at slim dot AI. Uh, and the recording of this session will be sent out to you shortly. We'll also include a link to a quick survey. So please complete that. Um, we really value your feedback. and We're going to be using that to uh, uh, help improve sessions in the future um and that's everything so other than reminding you that our discord's available for you to follow up with us after the fact um thank you all very much for coming and thank you once again to Aisha and joseph thank you for having us